All right. Um, welcome to session eight of ASAN seminar. And it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Suresh Subramanyam. Professor Suresh Subramanyam is a CEG alumnus from 1988 batch EEE department. He's a professor at George Washington University today. Without any further delay, let me um, pass the baton to Professor Suresh Subramanyam. Suresh, please take over. Okay. Thank you, Karthik. So first, uh, let me uh, share with you a little bit about uh, uh, my background and how I got here. So I did my schooling in Karnataka, Andhra, and finally finished my high school in Madurai. And I was in CEG from 1984 to 1988. And uh, I was in the ECE department, the Electronics and Communications Engineering. So after graduating, I took up a job as an R&D hardware engineer in HC HCL Limited. I don't know if the company still exists, but this was a company that uh, used to make uh, PCs at that time. And uh, it still does. It's, it still does. Okay. <laughs> so this was in Chennai. This was in Mailapur. They had an office and that's where I worked for a couple of years and I had a good time. Uh, they learned a lot of assembly language programming and some serious hardware uh, design. And, uh, but I was uh, missing academics. So I went back to being a student. Uh, so I enrolled in IASC as a master's uh, student and I spent a year there. And then I, a university in the US uh, gave me a full assistantship. And uh, so I decided to uh, take that and go there in 1991 to Tulane University. And I uh, got my master's degree, did my master's thesis in image processing. And uh, then after I finished that, I went to the University of Washington in Seattle to continue my PhD. First, I started in, in the area of image processing and computer vision. And then soon after, I changed directions. I started, uh, I took a class in uh, networking and I really enjoyed that and decided to change directions and continue my PhD. Uh, by focusing on uh, networking. So I took about three years to do that uh, because I spent about nine months to a year doing, doing image processing and uh, then finished my PhD in 1997, summer of 1997 and uh, joined George Washington University in uh, Washington, D.C. as an assistant professor in September 1997. So I've been here since then, uh, the same university. It's uh, almost 25 years now. And... Uh, these are the topics that I work on networking broadly, but within networking, mostly focusing on fiber optic networks, data center networks, cloud and edge networking and Internet of Things. So some of you may be familiar with uh, these terms. So besides uh, my work, I'm interested in a bunch of other things. So I am an avid puzzle solver. So I uh, solve crossword puzzles and uh, number puzzles. Uh, I like uh, physical activity, mainly hiking. Uh, I'm also interested in movies, cricket, tennis, and reading. So these are my interests. So uh, this class, for the next few lectures, I'm going to be just talking about uh, basics of networking. Now, I understand that some of you may have taken a class or will be taking a class on this subject uh, soon. So it could be a refresher for you, for, for some of you. So I'm gonna talk about uh, networking. By the way, uh, if you have questions, feel free to stop me at any time. Okay, I want this to be an informal uh, discussion rather than a, uh, you know, a purely one directional uh, lecture. Okay. All right, so uh, the, this uh, part of the course is on networking. Right. So I'm going to be introducing the basics of networking and Professor Bhuvana Krishnaswamy, who is going to follow me after three or four uh, classes, will be talking about a specific type of uh, network. Uh, so what is a communication network? So we usually represent a communication network as a cloud like this. Okay. We don't know what's inside this, and this is just a network that allows various devices to talk to each other. Okay. So what's inside this communication network? 
So it's both the equipment, the hardware and software and the facilities that provide the basic communication service. We call that as the communication network. So this is virtually invisible to the user. We typically only see the edge device of the network. For example, a Wi-Fi access point, or how you connect to the network. We don't really see what's inside the network, okay? So that's what's inside this network. This cloud here is what is, is, what is the network. So what's there? The equipment. So we have lots of different kinds of equipment, routers, servers, switches, multiplexers, hubs, modems. You may have heard of some of these terms, but each one of them has a specific function. That's what's inside the network. Then there's facilities, copper wires, coax cables, optical fibers, et cetera, telephone poles, and so on. Okay. So how are communication networks designed and operated? So how does this really work? That's the question that we're interested in, right? So let me take you back a couple of hundred years to talk about how networking has evolved since the mid 19th uh, century, right? So the earliest type of networks were telegraph networks. I don't know if any of you have heard about telegraph networks, but these are networks that are used to send messages. These are electrical uh, networks. They started as optical networks actually, but when we say telegraph, we usually mean the electrical telegraph. So you can send electrical signals from one point to another point, and those signals can be relayed by switches that are intermediate along to the final destination. And usually the messages that were sent were text messages. Now the text is a little bit uh, displaced here relative to the uh, figure. So telephone networks came next, so that's around this this time here, right here, 1875 to 1900 area. And then we have the internet, optical, wireless networks, next generation networks. So this chart basically shows that the rate of information transfer has exponentially increased over time. So what you have here is information transfer bits per second. That's what it is. So this is, you know, this is, uh, this is 100 bits per second, 10 to the two, 10 to the zero, 10 to the four, et cetera. So this is less than 100, per, 100 bits per second in telegraph networks. And now we're in the era of terabit per second communication. Right? Okay, so networking is basically connecting. So let me see, I have a chat message here. Okay. So networking is basically connecting various devices such as computers and other uh, devices that are connected to the network. These days, there are a lot of devices that are connected to the network, cars, washing machines, microwaves, all these things are now uh, you know, coming with an internet connection so they can all be connected to the network and be, can be accessed, controlled from any anywhere, any other device that's also connected to the network, right? So the number of devices has exploded, okay? So it is, really not possible to connect every pair of devices directly, right? How many dedicated transmission lines or how many links would be needed for connecting N users? So if you have a total of, let's say four users, okay, this figure shows there are five users, right? This box N, but there are five devices here, as you can see here. So if I want to connect these five de devices together, every pair of these devices together, how many connections would we need? It's five choose two. Right? Every pair of nodes, you have to put a connection between them, so a wire between them. So that's five choose two. So that would be 10 wires. Five choose two is 10, right? Now that's that's not a huge number. That's because there are only five nodes here. But if you have a thousand such devices that you want to connect with each other, then you need 1,000 choose two, which is like half a million. So now the number of connections, the number of uh, links is much larger. That's just for 1000 nodes. Now, if you have a million nodes, the number of wires that you need is going to be close to a trillion. So you see that the number of links that are needed to connect N nodes grows as N squares, N choose two, so N times N minus one over two, right? So this is infeasible really. So you cannot connect every pair of devices with a direct link, right? So what do we do then? 
Okay. Why can we not connect? Well, it's too too costly and requires too much space for the cables. So you just simply cannot connect every pair of devices with a cable. Right. So what do we do? How do we ensure that every device can communicate with every other device? Because if you're attached to the network, then you should be able to connect to every, any other device in the network. Right. You cannot say that I'm going to connect to just this group of devices, but not to this other group of devices. You should be able to talk to any other device in the network. So how do you achieve that? How do you, how do you achieve this kind of connectivity? So the idea is to use what is called as switching. Okay. So I'm going to show what switching is with the help of a whiteboard. So let me see if I can. So this is, so I'm going to stop sharing here and I'll show you my whiteboard. Can you all see my whiteboard? Yes. Okay, great. So, so we've, we've accepted that we cannot have a link between every pair of nodes, right? So still, how do we enable communication between all nodes? Okay, so the idea is to use a device called a, a switch, which dynamically provides connectivity as needed. Okay, so let me take a, the example of five nodes, right? So let's say five users. So we have five users like this. And instead of providing a direct wire between every pair of users, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a special network device. This is called as a switch. Okay and connect these nodes to the switch like this okay so there are five five nodes like this connect this device to the switch okay now what the switch does is it provides connectivity dynamically that is as needed on demand okay so for example if one wants to talk to two then the switch provides this connectivity. So this is a dashed line right there, which means that this is not a permanent connection. It is, this connection is provided for as long as one needs to talk to two, no, node one uh, needs to talk to node two, okay? Later on, if node one wants to talk to node three, this connection may be removed and we make this connection through the switch, right? Node one to node three. Okay, so the switch makes connections on demand. Okay, so when node one talks to node three, it sends some kind of a signal to the switch saying, hey, make me this connection. And the switch then makes this connection, right? So this is how switches work. So with this kind of arrangement, you can easily see that if you have N nodes, then you only need N links, okay? One link that connects to the switch and that's it, right? Now, the number of inputs to the switch is n, right? n being the number of nodes. So in this case, the switch has n inputs, okay? So what we have done now by putting the switch is that we have reduced the number of links in the network from n squared, approximately n squared to n, but now you have put all the complexity inside the switch. As n grows, the number of inputs to the switch increases, right? So now the switch becomes very complex. So if N is a million, if there are a million nodes, then your switch is going to have to switch between a million users, right? Million different input ports, okay? So that becomes an issue. And where do you locate the switch? Imagine if you have a switch that is going to connect all the users in a country on your country's network, where, where would you place the switch? So do you run cables from, from every device to that, to that switch in presumably located and in the center of the country or something like that? So that's impossible, right? So what do we do with that? So here's the idea. So the idea is not to use just a single switch, but to use multiple switches. So for example, I have multiple switches. So a switch is not connected just to users, but also to other switches. 
and maybe you have uh, other nodes here. Okay, so this is this is the idea. So this way, even if you have small size switches, you can connect them together. Okay, and build a bigger network. So let's call this node number one. Let's call this node number ten here. So if node number one wants to talk to node number ten, wants to be connected to node number ten, there are many ways through this network. So now you, this is a network. Right, because you have lots of different switches, lots of different lots of different nodes. So there are many paths through this network. For example, for example, this could be a path. Okay. This is another path. Okay. So there are many paths through this network from node one to node 10. Okay. Which path do you choose? Well, that is that's a decision that needs to be made. Okay. Maybe one path is better than the other. So just like if you're going from one place to another place, there are many ways to go from one place to another place, right, on the road. Which road do you choose? Well, it depends on traffic and what time you're traveling and all of that stuff, how wide the road is and all of that. Your GPS, when you put in the directions, it'll tell you, it'll give you which is the shortest road, which is the uh, uh, fastest road, et cetera, right? So just like that in a network, there could be a shortest road, there could be a fastest road, and all of that stuff, right? So do you take the red path or the green path or maybe the yellow path, like this, okay? So that is going to be decided by some kind of an algorithm that decides which is the best path to choose. And once that path is chosen, these switches must be told that you have to make a connection. Let's say we choose the yellow path, yeah? So this switch, must be told that okay, this connection, these switches must be told that these connections have to be made. Okay, as you see with the dashed lines. Okay, so this path can be used for this connection. Okay, so you see how a network has been built. Now, with this concept of using multiple switches and connecting these switches together, it's possible to connect any two devices that want to communicate with each other. So node one doesn't have to be connected to every other switch or every other node, but only needs to be connected to one switch, this, this switch right here, okay? And those switches are in turn connected to other switches and so on, okay? Okay, so that's, that's how this works. So let me stop sharing this. And go back to go back to this. Okay. All right. So now you understand what uh, what switching does, right? So switching is basically by by using small size switches, which are able to provide connectivity on demand that is as required. You can build a large network, and you can realize connectivity among thousands, millions of, of devices, millions of nodes, right? Okay. Next, let me walk you through this evolution of uh, networking, okay? So I mentioned telegraph networks already, right? So telegraph networks, they use digital transmission. Right? These were 200 years ago, but they used digital transmission at that time, okay? In the sense that there were two kinds of symbols that were transmitted. You're all familiar with the Morse code, right? The Morse code is the symbol that was used for telegraphy, dots and dashes. So all messages were coded through dots and dashes and transmitted, transmitted as you know in that form. So a dot is basically a, a short electrical pulse, and a dash is an elongated electrical, a long electrical pulse, right? Then telegraph networks you know, basically uh, stopped being used or for the most part in the early 20th century. They were replaced by telephone networks, which used a different kind of switching called yes, a circuit switching, as opposed to message switching used by telegraph networks. And telephone networks started with analog transmission and then moved to digital transmission later. And I'll talk a little bit about what analog and digital mean here. 
And then... Is it okay to the, interrupt with a brief question, Suresh? Of course, of course, yes. What, what is message switching? You, you, you mentioned yeah, I'm, switching. I'm going, to, I'm, going to, I'm going to talk about that in the next slide. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Okay, then internet, which uses something called as packet switching. And uh, next generation internet is basically building on the current uh, internet. Okay. So I have some more details on each of these kinds of switching here. So telegraph network, right? Now, what is the point of learning about something that is extinct? Well, the thing is, it had, you know, it introduced some, some features that we still use in today's networks, right? So one of the questions, one of the, the features that it introduced was message switching, which is, which is right here. Okay. First, as I mentioned, it's digital transmission, text messages. This was a network that is used to simply transmit text messages, right? Now, you may not have actually used any telegraph network, but I have. I've actually seen a telegraph station in person. These used to be in post offices in India. So I've gone to the post office and actually did a tour of a telegraph, uh, telegraph uh, station. Okay. So you can send a telegram, you know, for example, urgent messages, you know, father sick, you know, something like that, because we didn't have telephones at that time, right? So this was the type of message that is sent. And you give this to the post office, the post office would then convert that text message into dots and dashes, and then you know, use the telegraph network to transmit these messages, okay? I forget about, uh, forget about this multiplexing part. That's, that's, I'm not going to talk about that here. But message switching, so what does that mean? So messages contain source and destination addresses. So when you take your message, you know, like a father's sake, for example, right? You give it to the post office. The post office is going to convert that to a message consisting of dots and dashes, okay? Because that is was what can be transmitted over the telegraph network, okay? There is also a destination telegraph station. So this message is eventually transmitted to a destination station, which is going to print out the text message. It's going to convert the dots and dashes to the text message. And then somebody is going to physically take that you know, receive telegraph, telegram message and deliver it to the recipient, you know, to maybe your sibling or somebody like that, right? So these messages contain not just the message itself, the, not just the, you know, the message that the user wants to transmit, but also source and the destination address of the telegraph stations, okay? And the way the messages are transmitted are, the source station would transmit the message to, let's say an intermediate station because there is no direct link to the destination station. So yes, as you can see in this, in this figure right here. So here's a source that is transmitting the message to inter intermediate switch. So the intermediate switch basically recovers the entire message and then retransmits it, okay? It retransmits it. So this is just like, you know, this uh, 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 messengers, right? So you, you send a message, you, you, you carry a message up to the next messenger relay that message and the next messenger will then take it and deliver it to the next mes uh, next messenger and so on okay so this is how messages are transmitted from one place to another place right this is how it used to be that before the electrical communication people used to carry these messages from one place to another place right so you transmit it you carry it for some distance some other person will carry it for some other distance and so on until it eventually reaches the destination so that's the that's kind of the idea here so messages are forwarded hop by hop one by you know one by one over each of these links along the way to the final destination and these are really switches so initially this was all manual and eventually they all got automated so these became automated switches so based on the addresses they were programmed and they would automatically forward the message from one place to another place so this is what is called as message switching so as a as a follow-on question i'm just trying to yeah. learn here um mm -hmm. is uh, so is a postal network where we send letters and so on with right. an address and so on is that a message that switching? is definitely message switching yes exactly okay. Okay. okay okay so that's a that's a very good example of of, of message switching you send a, a letter the letter is going to go through multiple post offices right and eventually get to the destination so it's essentially this message is being switched mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay. okay, so that's the telegraph network. Now, this was replaced by the telephone network, which of course is still being used today, right? So there was a special network that was built just for carrying voice signals. This is the telephone network, okay? 
Uh, this started in the mid uh, 20th century and uh, initially it was analog and in the US it started being converted to a digital network in the 1960s. So it's right now it's a digital network. Okay, the, 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 most of the telephone network is a digital network. Your phone may still be, you know, your, your uh, telephone instrument is still an analog instrument, but it's converted to digital form as soon as it goes to the first switch. Okay. And it uses the concept of time division multiplexing. This is basically combining multiple telephone calls onto a single link. Okay, so this is a method of combining multiple telephone calls into a single link. But the most, the biggest difference between the telephone network and the telegraph network was in the way messages are switched. Okay, so in the case of the telegraph uh, network, a message is received by the first switch, recovered completely, and then retransmitted onto the next switch, and the same process is repeated. So that's called as message switching. Right. So, so this is this technique is called a store and forward. So messages are received, they are stored, and then they are going to be forwarded to the next one. Right. So the kind of switching that is used in the telephone network is very different. It's called the circuit switching. So what happens in a telephone network when you dial a number? Right. So you're picking up the phone, you're dialing a number. So when you dial the digits of the number immediately the network goes into action. It interprets these numbers that you're dialing. So it knows what number you're calling. It also, the network also knows where that number is located, okay? So what switches need to be activated for connecting the source to the destination, right? And this connection is made before you can actually speak on the phone. So when you dial the digits, the switches are programmed to make this. For example, here's, here's one particular switch, okay? So the source is here, the destination is here. You may not go through just one switch, you may go through multiple switches, but this just shows a simplified case of one switch, right? So the connection is made from here to here. Now, this connection used to be made manually. So if you saw some old movies, you might've seen people, you know, plugging cards, into a big board, right? So these connections, so th those are manual operators. They would physically make those connections, okay, as requested. But now it's all completely automated. When you dial those digits, these connections are made inside the switch. It happens very quickly. So, you know, you don't notice it. It happens in, in milliseconds. So you don't really notice it. So when you dial, as soon as you finish dialing, you're connected and you're talking, right? But in that very short time period, this is what happens. All these switches are programmed and uh, connection from the source to the destination, physical connection from the source to the destination is made. And whether you speak or not, that connection exists for you, okay? That's why most of these uh, you know, the connections are charged based on the amount of time. That's because whether you speak or not, doesn't matter. You are holding up that link, those links on the path, right? It also introduced a few other features that are very useful in today. First of all, it uses the decimal numbering system and hierarchical structure, right? Hierarchical structure means, you know, a call to India, you first have to dial the area, uh, area code, uh, the country code for India, 91, right? Or if you're calling from, to the, calling the US from India, you have to dial the country code 001. Right? And then if you're calling the US, then there's something called the area code, which identifies a particular area. And then you have seven digits after that, right? So for example, 202 is the area code for where I am, Washington DC, it's 202, right? So this allows the switches to identify that, it, it just needs to look at the 202 and say, okay, this call needs to be switched towards Washington DC. Okay, I don't need to worry about exactly which neighborhood, which area within Washington DC this, this phone is located, but the phone is, has to be routed to Washington DC. That's all you need to know, right? So it simplifies, simplifies this routing of connections, okay? Uh, so telephone networks have a lot of intelligence inside the network because, because they have to figure out how to set up this path and you know, how to program the switches and all of that stuff. So we say that this is an intelligent uh, network, okay? 
Now, computer network is the network that we are we're, we're very familiar with now. I mean, we also use the telephone network that still exists today. But computer network uses a different kind of switching. It actually uses some of the features of the uh, telegraph uh, uh, network and borrows some of the features of the telephone network as well. Okay. So when did this start? It started in the 1950s, okay, when telegraph technology was adapted to computers. 1960s was when the first computer network became operational. And this network was a very simple network actually. So it was used for an airline reservation system where you had dumb terminals that were distributed and they had access to a shared host computer. Computing was very expensive at that time, right? There were no personal computers at the time. And you know, computers that we were used only by big companies for specialized uh, needs, right? So this computer was used for holding airline reservations. And these terminals would be connected to this computer which held all the reservations so people could access a common reservation database, right? So that's how it was used. 1970s is when computer networking started being seriously looked at. The computers were directly connected to each other. So there is a... Uh, an organization in the US called ARPA or DARPA, Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, which is a research arm of the US Department of Defense. And they fund a lot of different kinds of uh, projects. Okay. And they were the organization that funded the development of the internet, or which it used to be called the ARPA. ARPA stands for the Advanced Research Projects Agency. Right. So another of their uh, of the uh, outcomes of their funded research is the well-known GPS. So the GPS was it started as a military technology, but now of course all of us use GPS. You know our phones have GPS and and we, we use it to you know, use that with Google Maps to find directions. Right. So this is when the famous TCP/IP protocols. You know even if you don't know anything about networking, you may have heard of these terms TCP/IP internet protocols were, were developed, okay? As well as something called as Ethernet local area network, okay? So 80s, 90s, and 2000s saw the development of new applications and the tremendous growth of the internet. So the internet became commercialized. It, it did not used to be commercialized, but now it's commercialized. There are a lot of companies that offer internet service and you have to pay money to purchase the internet service. Right? There's email, file transfer, web, P2P, social networking. And the kind of applications is really, you know, nobody would have imagined just 10 years back that you know, there would be TikTok videos and so on, right? So new things keep coming up. Okay? So you heard uh, the term internet protocols here. So what is a protocol exactly? So a protocol is the following. So if a machine, if a computer has to communicate with another computer, right, they need to speak the same language. Okay, So a protocol is basically a set of rules that govern how two or more communicating parties are to interact. Right Now, as people, if we talk to others, then we have to have speak in a common language. So I'm speaking in English, so you all understand English, right? Now, if I speak in Russian, you know, probably you're not going to understand that because you, you know, most likely do not know Russian, right? So that doesn't work. So you have to speak the common language. So basically, these protocols are essentially a set of rules that say, okay, here's the common language that, that these use. So internet protocol, transmission control protocol, or TCP, you're familiar with HTTP. And email uses a protocol called a simple mail transfer protocol or SMTP. So that's... So there are a lot of these different kinds of protocols for different purposes that are used in the internet, right? Okay, so let's get into a little bit more in depth about how networking actually happens. Okay, so there are switches and you're connecting and all of that, but how does it really work? How do I send a message from one place to another place? Okay, this is a very complex process, okay? So, what we did was we took that complex process and broke it up into smaller tasks or smaller pieces. And these pieces are called as layers or these tasks are called as layers. 
just like if you write, if all of you have done some programming at some point of time, I suppose, right? So if you want to write a, a large program, okay, you don't write the entire program as a single piece, the main function and then everything in that main function, you might have various smaller functions, which you will call within your main function, right? So that's kind of the idea here. So the layers are basically like these smaller functions that can be put together to create a bigger, to, to accomplish a bigger task, okay? So layering simplifies design, implementation, and testing. Okay, layers are somewhat different from the functions analogy that I gave you because a function really can be called from any other function, typically. But a layer suggests that there is some kind of an order here, inner layer, outer layer, et cetera. This seems like some kind of an order there. That's exactly what it is. So the layers are here, layer one, then layer two on top of that, layer three on top of that, layer four on top of that, et cetera, okay? What does this mean on top of that? It means that a layer can be invoked only by the layer immediately above it. So there's only one other layer that can call the layer below, okay? So at each layer, so what, what is this layer? So each layer has a certain set of functions, okay? It does a subtask, right? And these tasks are implemented by protocols. So there's a certain set of functions that each layer performs. And there might be a protocol that accomplishes, accomplishes a certain set of functions at that layer. Another protocol might accomplish a certain other set of functions or maybe in a slightly different way. So there are a lot of protocols that are available at each layer. And a protocol makes calls, like I said, it's function calls for services from the layer below. That's the only thing that is allowed. You cannot just go and call some other layer. You have to call only the layer below. But this layering provides flexibility in modifying and evolving protocols and services without having to change the layers below. So if you want to change something, you can play with just one of the layers, keep everything else the same. So this accelerates innovation. Okay, because if you had just the whole thing is in a single layer, then you have to, you make a change, then the whole thing might change, okay? So layering is basically like a function. So you know, just like in a large program, if you want to change a particular function, then you only have to change that particular function. You don't have to mess with the other functions or the main function, right? Whereas if you don't have this, if you have like one big jumble program, then you might have to make changes in lots of places if you want to change, you know, add some functionality, some new functionality to your program, right? Uh, how are we doing on time? 50 minutes, right? Oh. Correct. We have, yeah. we, we still have 20 minutes. So Correct. it's actually 50 minutes. I mean, so five for setup and five for wind up. So we have the whole hour actually. Oh, we have the whole hour. Okay, okay, all right. We have 20 so. more minutes. Okay, are there any questions so far? I'm gonna pause for, uh, uh, a few seconds here to see if there are any questions so far. It doesn't no? matter um, how the, I mean, if it's a simple question or not, just feel free. A exactly, there are, there are no, uh, you know, there are no dumb questions, okay? Feel free to ask if you have any, okay? All right, so it looks like there aren't any at this point, but I'll also, uh, you know, we'll also have a Q&A at the end. Okay. Okay, so so now you have some idea about the uh, about the concept of layering, right? So what are these layers? So, so layer, each layer does some functions that is part of the entire networking process, right? So what are these layers? Okay, and what functions do each layer do, okay? So there is an organization that came up with a structure like this. It says, okay, we're gonna break down the whole process into seven layers, okay? And going from the bottom, these layers are called the physical layer, data link layer, network layer, transport layer, session layer, presentation layer, and application layer, okay? So that every device is going to implement these seven layers. Well, actually it's not every device, every host, that is every computer that is, that is going to be, host means a computer or an end device 
that attaches to the network. Okay, so every host is going to implement these seven layers. But a network device, for example, a switch, that's a network device. That is not a host. It is not something that is going to generate data to transmit to others by itself. A switch is used to connect two hosts, right? Or to connect to other switches, okay? Otherwise you don't need a switch, right? So if it's, so switch is a network device. It's not a user device, it's a network device, okay? So if it's a switch, it has these three layers, physical layer, data leak layer, and network layer, okay? So this is an organization. So what do each of these layers do? Okay, what functions do they do? So let's break it down a little bit. So what does the physical layer do? Let's start from the, let's start from the bottom. What does the physical layer do? Okay, the physical layer, the responsibility of the physical layer is to transfer bits across a direct link. Okay, so let me go back to the slide here. So let's say this is a host or a computer. Okay, this on the left-hand side, and this is a switch. So the computer is going to send a message to the switch. Okay. By the way, computers use a variant, a variant of message switching, which is used by the telegraph networks. It's used, it uses a variant of uh, a message switching called as packet switching. And a packet is basically like a message, but with a limit on the size of the message. Okay. Now, computers can generate messages which are very long. For example, you want to transmit a file, the file could be several meg megabytes. Right? That's a very long message. So, and transmitting long messages was an issue because if you transmit a long message, you know, one of the things that might happen when you transmit something, when you transmit data is there could be errors in the data, right? You're transmitting these uh, bits and some bits could get flipped because of noise in the system, okay? If there's an error in the file transmission, then you would have to retransmit that entire file. Okay, so you can imagine the problem that that would cause if you have a very large file, because if there is even a single error in the file, you have to retransmit the entire file and hope hope that your retransmission was okay. There are no errors. If there are errors again, then you have to re retransmit the file and so on until it's received without errors. Right. So. Long messages means that if there are errors, it can take a very long time for the message to be successfully transmitted, okay? So in packet switching, what is done is long messages are broken into smaller pieces called as packets, okay? So if you, if you have a message which is a megabyte long, you break it up into small pieces, maybe make, break it up into a thousand, 1000 byte messages, right? And then you transmit each of them separately. Now, if there is an error, probably it's in one of these 1,000 byte packets, right? So you have to retransmit only those 1,000 bytes. You don't have to retransmit the other 999 packets, which do not have any error. Does it make sense? So that's that's why we want to place a limit on the size of 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 the message that we want to transmit. So in this case. If you have a large message, you simply break it up into smaller pieces, call them packets. You transmit these packets one by one, and at the destination, you put these packets together to recreate your original message, right? Okay, so coming back to the layers here. So this is the, this is the layering uh, concept. And what do each of these layers do? Okay, let's start from the bottom, okay? Eventually, whether you're transmitting a message or a packet, they're all made of bits. Right? Okay, it's a digital network. They're all made of bits, ones and zeros. Okay, so at some point you're going to have to, have to transmit a bit from one node to another node, where a node could be a computer, a end device, or a switch. Right? So we have to be able to transmit a bit from one node to another node over a link. Okay, that's the job of the physical layer. What does it mean transmit a node from, uh, transmit a bit from one node to another node? So you want to transmit a one bit or a zero bit. How do you do that? Obviously you cannot transmit the number one directly, right? Because the communication is, you know, it is, it's in a, 
It's an electrical communication medium or an optical communication medium, right? We have either an optical fiber or a copper cable or a wireless channel between these two nodes, right? So you have to transmit this in the form of electromagnetic signals, right? So that is what the physical layer does. It maps the one bit and the zero bit into actual waveforms that can be transmitted over that particular medium, whatever that medium is, a copper, copper wire or fiber optic cable or whatever it is, right? So that's the physical layer, okay? Let's say a physical layer is designed and we know how to transfer bits now. Now we can build on this, right? So I know how to transfer bits. What else can I do? Bits by themselves do not have any meaning, okay? Just like letters by themselves, the alphabets, by themselves don't have any meaning. A, B, C, D, E, F, okay? These by themselves do not have any meaning, right? We create words by putting together these alphabets in specific order, right? And words strung together make sentences. And this is how we create information, right? So just like that, bits by themselves do not have any meaning. You have to group bits together to form messages, right? So these are called as frames. So the data link layer is responsible for transferring frames, okay? Which is a group of bits across a direct link, okay? Now, it's known that when you transmit bits, some bits could get flipped because of noise, like I just said, right? Because of, because of disturbances in the system, okay? And in some cases, that may be okay. You can live with some errors, but in some cases, it's not okay. You cannot live with errors, right? For example, if you send an email, you expect that the email is going to be delivered without any errors. So you, you don't expect that sometimes the A is going to be changed to a B, right? If you write A, you expect the A to be delivered as it is, as A, right? So you don't want errors in these kinds of things. Okay, so somebody has to fix these errors if they do occur. So the data link layer is one of the layers that takes that responsibility and says, I'm going to transfer frames across a link in a reliable manner, okay? So this idea of putting together bits into frames and recognizing that this is a frame, this is one frame, this is another frame, et cetera, that process is called as framing. And the function of Detecting errors and recovering from errors is called as error control. So these are the two main functions of the data link layer. Okay? Now we're going up from the bottom, right? Physical layer transfers bits. The data link layer transfers frames, okay? Then the third layer is the network layer. So the transfers frames across the direct link. That means these two nodes are directly connected by a link. But we know in a network, not all nodes are directly connected by a link because we may have to go through intermediate switches, right? So the network layer basically takes, looks at the entire network and says, I take the responsibility of transferring packets. Remember packets are just size limited messages, right? Transfers packets from one host. Host in the, here means computer or an end device as opposed to a network device, okay? So it transfers packets from one host to another, okay? So my computer is connected to, so right now I'm in the Zoom session, so you, you're seeing my video, you're seeing my slides, et cetera, okay? How is this happening? There's a network layer protocol that is transferring the packets of my PowerPoint slides to you, to your computer. That's how you're seeing all of this, okay? The main functions that are needed to do this is we need to identify the address of these end devices, of these hosts, okay? So your computer, how do we identify that the packet has to be sent? There is a, the, the, you, your computer has an address. And knowing that address, there is a routing and forwarding algorithm that is inside the network that's running to send these packets from these PowerPoint slides to your computer, okay? So that's how you're seeing all of this stuff, right? 
Then the next layer above that is called as the transport layer, which transfers Sorry, Suresh, data. Can I interrupt from... again? Sure. sure, yes. Sorry. Uh, so you use the word packets and frames. Uh, yeah. Are they uh, both of them the same? Excellent question. So excellent question. Okay. So they're both for all purposes, you can say both of them are the same. Okay. So these are just terminology that is used in different layers, but they're all basically a group of bits mm -hmm. that contain some user information. Right? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So I'll start with this slide and uh, take questions. Okay. So transport layer. So if you go back to this layer, uh, to this figure here, so physical layer, data link layer, network layer, right? So this one transfers bits, converts, converts bits to waveforms. And so it's, so you can tell the physical layer, transfer this, you know, send this one bit to the other node, send the zero bit to the other node, et cetera. That's what the physical layer does. A data link layer groups these bits together. Say, I have this message, one, zero, zero, one, zero, send this frame to the next link. The data link layer does that, right? Network layer is responsible for kind of end-to-end -end communication. So it, take, it takes this 10010 message from this host, goes through the network layer of the intermediate switches, and then delivers that to the host here. And you, you're able to see my cursor, right? Yes, the cursor is showing okay. up just fine. Okay, okay, okay. So there's network layer here. Okay, so now with these three layers, you already have the ability to send packets, which are a bunch of bits from a host or from your computer to another computer, right? Now, what do these other layers do then? The transport layer transfers data from a process in a host to a process in another host, okay? Now it's possible for me to be communicating with the same, for example, let's say I have the web page of the New York Times, right? The newspaper, New York Times, open on my, you know, on my uh, on my browser, right? So on one window, I could be uh, reading the front page of the New York Times. On another browser window, I could be looking at some sports page, let's say. Okay. On a third window, I could be happy, you know, I could be solving a crossword puzzle or whatever it is, right? They're all basically different tabs that I have to the same exact location, but I'm using different applications here. Right now, I need to make sure that when I get a response from the New York Times server, the response goes to the appropriate application that I have open in these three tabs. Right? They shouldn't be mixed up. Okay, so the transport layer allows for transferring data from a process, which is like a program in one computer, to a program in another computer. Okay, so it adds the little bit of granularity to the communication. Okay, so it's you're not just transferring from one computer to another computer, but from a program in one computer to a program in another computer specifically, because you could be sending an email, you could be browsing at the same time, just to distinguish between these, the data must be delivered to the appropriate application and shouldn't be mixed up, okay? Then there are three layers above that session, presentation and application. Uh, these are typically merged into a single layer these days now, application layer. And these, are, these provide application specific functions, for example, email application or web service or streaming audio service. So these are all different. They have slightly different needs and the application layer basically provides all of that. But the bottom four layers below that, they are the same function because you want to transfer a bunch of bits, no matter which application is generating those bits, right? Email or web or uh, audio, whatever it is, is generating that those bits. You want to transmit groups of bits from a process in one computer to a process in another computer. That's what is accomplished by the by by the sum of these bottom four layers. Okay. So this is kind of an overview of what, how the overall process is broken up into smaller tasks and these tasks provide the end-to-end -end, uh, service, okay? So I'm gonna stop here, it's almost an hour, so and pause uh, for any questions. So let me stop sharing so I can see you all.
any questions thank you thank you suresh actually i mean um if it's all right we have a few minutes uh, maybe if the, when the students take some time uh, i want to ask her some basic questions so you, sure. you mentioned all this uh, uh, the, the layers uh, yeah. and each time even when learning these in undergraduate times the the one of the things that was uh, uh, difficult to wrap the mind around was to say oh how does this fit in some of the networks that we use so if there is an internet uh, email that i'm sending or how does it map or now when you describe it the question arises is oh where in a mobile phone what maps to what tcp ip and and so on is fine but uh, uh, how does I, i'm not uh, familiar with the cell phone networks i'm curious to know how does that map let's say with a, we are talking on zoom today let's say you're, you're we're using our phones to talk on zoom today what okay. are those layers and how do they map onto my cell phone okay so good question so let me uh, let me take the uh, uh, cell phone application or this is an email application for example right mm -hmm. okay so email application the all of the things that pertain to what the email does that you know formulation of the messages converting into a message that is all done by your smtp mm -hmm. right the email protocol the application layer protocol for email mm -hmm. right okay then so let me uh, go back to this so I can let me share the screen again for one second what happened to my okay all right so then you uh, invoke uh, a transport layer for tra transport layer call you make a transport layer call which is tcp in this case right mm -hmm. transmission control protocol i don't know if that's familiar to to all of you but but you know what it is right so tcp right mm -hmm. tcp is going to look at which is the node that you need to make need to make a connection to you know what other host the email message is going to be sent to and establishes a connection with a tcp it establishes a tcp connection with that particular host mm -hmm. right okay now once the connection is established then the message that comes through which is email message that is broken up into multiple packets is going to be given to the network layer and tcp uh, the transport layer is going to tell the network layer transfer these packets to this other host right mm -hmm. And the network layer then takes up its job because it knows by interacting with the other network layers in these intermediate nodes that which way the packets need to flow, right? To get to the other to get to the other host. Okay. And how does the network layer do that? Well, it asks the data link layer to say, okay, here's the packet that I want to get eventually to this other to this other host, but you data link layer, just send it to the next node, which is the switch right here. Okay. So send in the case path. of a cell phone, is this the cell tower that we talked to? Yes, then that would come at the physical layer here. Okay. Okay. So this is at the bottom is the link here, right? So if you want to take one particular link, for example, your cell phone, mm -hmm. you are you are communicating with the cell tower, right? Mm -hmm. So that is a direct communication. So that is one link right here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. at the bottom of the physical layer here mm -hmm. so when you send a message you know it's basically eventually it's ones and zeros mm -hmm. right so the, the physical layer is responsible for converting those ones and zeros to the physical wireless radio signals that are transmitted from your phone mm -hmm. that depends on the particular technology that is used on the phone right mm -hmm. so different for uh, different providers have different frequencies etc so it maps into the specific signals and then it goes to your to the to the cell tower mm -hmm. so that's one link in this in this network mm -hmm. right so once it gets to the cell tower then the cell tower is going to retransmit the, that message to you know using a wired network normally mm -hmm. right until it reaches the destination cell tower mm -hmm. okay and there could be many switches along the way and once it reaches the destination cell tower, then the last one is also an over the air communication. Mm -hmm. Right? So that's how the bits are flowing. But once the physical layer basically hides all of the details, right? Mm -hmm. So you know how to send bits from one link to another, from one node to another node. And the even data link layer builds on that. We, we that? even hear about uh, satellite, I mean, ISRO, exactly. lectures, right. and so on. 
right so, it's all so, th so that's again the physical layer so that's so, so inst you know you can transfer it over a, a, a you know a mobile uh, link or it could be uh, a satellite link like you said right so you transfer it from a ground station so that's the physical layer and once you have the physical layer that takes responsibility for doing that you don't need to worry about well, what kind of waveform should I use? That's the job of the physical layer, mm -hmm. right? Once that is done, then you can say, okay, I know how to transmit bits over this link. Mm -hmm. I don't care about what type of link it is. Mm -hmm. How can I build on that, right? So that's what these applications do. I mean, Facebook, you know, they don't really care about whether it's going on satellite or not. Mm -hmm. Once an application works on a small network, it should immediately be scalable to the entire internet. That's the, mm -hmm. that's the fundamental idea, mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. Okay. Thank you, Suresh. Students, okay. any uh, last few minute questions? Please feel free to speak or type in the chat. Um, all right. Thank you so okay. much, Suresh. As a, as a reminder to the students, the next session will also be <laughs> Professor Suresh's session. It's going to be at 9.30 p.m. on Thursday. So uh, uh, just a, it's a little different timing than today. It's at 9.30 p.m. on Thursday. Um, please uh, join, tell your friends. Um, it, it would be great to have as many of you participating. And uh, thank you so much, Suresh. Uh, appreciate uh, the time that you've given us. Okay, pleasure. Thank you. Thank See you. you all in a couple of days. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.